we are used to the optics of lenses, mirrors, and prisms. Obviously, these are very useful. But possibly surprisingly, there are many optical problems we can think of, none of which violate any laws of physics, that these lenses, mirrors, and prisms cannot apparently solve. A simple example is separating mixed up light beams. Now, however, we know how to do that, and understanding that gives us a completely different and powerful way of looking at optics. A key point here is that this new way of looking at optics suits the emerging technological field of silicon photonics. Indeed, it allows us to use very complex silicon photonic circuits while still being able to control them. In fact, some of the resulting circuits can configure themselves automatically, even without calculations. This new way of looking at optics, taken together with these new circuits, architectures and algorithms in silicon photonics, open a whole new class of optical systems, with applications limited only by our imaginations. To understand what I mean here, let's look at designing some very simple optical components. We'll start with a mirror. We design, as it were, a plane mirror by choosing its angle, so that it takes a beam of one angle and changes it into a beam of another angle. For another beam at yet another angle, the mirror changes it to a beam of yet another angle. But we have no independent control over what happens for that second beam. Similarly, we design a lens by choosing its index and its curvatures so that it takes a plane wave in one direction and focuses it to a spot. For another plane wave in another direction, the lens focuses it to another spot, which is very useful, but we have no independent control over what happens from that second beam. This kind of behaviour is general for what we could think of as thin optical components, such as thin holograms, diffractive optical elements, spatial light modulators, adaptive optics, or metasurfaces. We design them to perform some useful function for one input beam, but we have no independent control of what happens for other beams. So these are not arbitrary optical components. Arbitrary optical components would allow us separately to choose what happens for each different input. Suppose we have two different beams, for example from an optical fibre. Perhaps one has a single bump in it, and perhaps another has two bumps in it. Mathematically, two non-zero beams are orthogonal if this kind of integral between the two fields or beams comes to zero. Here, the product of the single bump beam and the two bump beam would be negative in the top half, and positive in the bottom half. And hence, the resulting integral would indeed be zero. If both of these beams emerge simultaneously from the fibre, how can we separate them? For example, to different fibres. And it's particularly important to understand how we would do this without fundamental loss. So here we have our single bumped beam coming into our hypothetical device here, and it comes out the top as some kind of beam. And then here is our two bumped beam coming in, and it is to come out as some kind of beam, but now out of the bottom, so it's clearly separated from the other one. And if we come in with a linear superposition of these, we want them to come out separately here. The components should be separate. In situations with fixed or highly symmetric beams, we do actually have some ways of doing this that can work with fairly low loss. But for general cases of lower symmetry and or higher complexity, such as this pair of beams here, which can in fact superpose to give us this beam at a particular phase of the superposition of these, how would we make a device to separate out those two, with this one coming out as a beam here and this one coming out as a beam there? These beams are indeed orthogonal, by the way. And even worse would be if we had beams that changed in time. General solutions to this problem have really not been known. One approach is to divide the beam into patches. So we can presume that it will be good enough to imagine that we can divide the beam into a finite number of patches. 
we treat each of these patches as if it was approximately uniform in intensity and in phase. And at least with a sufficiently large number of patches, this could be a good enough approximation, and the loss associated with this sampling could be made small enough. Even with relatively small numbers of patches, we are able to distinguish beams of low or moderate complexity. For example, this number of patches would obviously distinguish these two, but even this smaller number would be sufficient. But still, even in principle, how can we separate these beams? To see this, we need to look at a way of building optical systems out of interferometers. And let's start now by looking at a simple so-called Mach-Zender interferometer, and let's see how we can build up useful circuits by combining them. Consider a waveguide Mach-Zender interferometer, formed from two 50-50 beam splitters, that is equal beam splitters, and at least two phase shifters, one phi to control the relative phase of the two inputs, and a second theta to control the relative phase on the interferometer arms. Suppose we shine mutually coherent light into both interferometer inputs, with possibly different amplitudes and phases. We can adjust phi to minimize the power at, say, the bottom output. The fields from the two inputs are now in antiphase, they're in opposite phase at the bottom output. Adjusting theta sets the split ratio of the Mach sender. That is, how the power from one input would be split between the outputs. Interestingly, for 50-50 beam splitters, adjusting theta does not change the relative phase with which the two inputs mix at an output. That is controlled only by phi. So, since we have already minimized the bottom output power by adjusting phi, if we now adjust theta, we will be able to minimize that power to zero because the contributions from the two inputs are already in antiphase at the bottom output, and it's always possible, therefore, to find some ratio of these two contributions that is exactly equal and opposite. So, in a Mach sender with 50-50 beam splitters, for any relative input amplitudes and phases, we can null out the power at the bottom output by two successive single-parameter power minimizations, first using phi and second using theta. Now we can take the next step, which is to combine multiple interferometers, for example, in a chain or diagonal line. So here we have a diagonal line of three Mach senders, one here, one here, and one here. We have four input waveguides with light shining into each one of them, all mutually coherent, and we have one waveguide at the right where we hope to look for the output. We also have three detectors here. So we start by minimizing the power in detector D1, this one here, by adjusting the corresponding phi, and then the corresponding theta. Putting all the power now in the upper output of this Mach sender and that changes the power in the output at the far right at the top. Then we minimize the power in detector D2, that's this one here, by adjusting the corresponding phi and the corresponding theta, again to put all the power in the upper output now of this Mach sender, which also changes the power at the top right. Finally, we minimize the power in detector D3, this one here, by adjusting the corresponding phi and then the corresponding theta to put all the power, now the total input power, in the upper output. So we could, for example, have grating couplers that couple some free space beam shining onto the top of this chip on the right here to a set of waveguides. Then, using our algorithm, we could automatically couple all the power from those grading couplers to the one output guide on the top right. This could run continuously, tracking changes in the beam, and still putting all the power in the output. This self-aligning beam coupler is an interesting device in itself. Obviously, it can align itself to couple a beam, but it has several other possible uses. For example, it can track an input source by continuing to align itself, 
both in angle and incidentally in focusing. It can correct for aberrations. It can analyze amplitude and phase of the components of a beam. And it has several other possible uses. But how does it help us separate beams? Once we have aligned beam 1 to output 1 using detectors D11 to D13, that is, these detectors here working with this diagonal line of Mach senders, an orthogonal input beam 2 would pass entirely into the detectors D11 to D13. None of it would appear at the output. That is, if at the input, instead of the vector of amplitudes we originally shone in, that we use to align all of that power to this output. If we shone in a vector of amplitudes that was mathematically orthogonal to the first one, none of it would appear out here. And indeed, if it did, it would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So all of the power in this second beam now will actually pass into these detectors. If we make these detectors mostly transparent, all of this second beam would actually pass into the second diagonal row, that is, this diagonal row of Mach's enders, where we could self-align it to output 2 using power minimization in these two detectors. This would separate two overlapping orthogonal beams to separate outputs, which actually is something that we really did not know how to do before. Adding more rows and self-alignments separates a number of orthogonal beams equal to the number of beam segments, here four, the four waveguides. If we now put identifying tones on each orthogonal input beam, that is a small modulation at some frequency, for example, and we have the corresponding diagonal row of detectors look just for that tone, then the mesh can continually adapt to the orthogonal inputs, even when they are all present at the same time, and even if they change. And this is exactly what my colleagues at the Politecnico di Milano did. They took four separate fibre inputs and combined them in a multi-mode mixer so that when they came out, they were completely mixed up. But they had put identifying tones on each of these input fibres and by using those tones to pull out specific inputs when configuring using these detectors, they were able to separate out all of the beams again, even though they were completely mixed here. And incidentally, if they changed the multi-mode mixing here by heating up this multi-mode mixer, the system would reconfigure automatically to separate the beams out again. Note this system is an example of exactly what we discussed at the beginning, an optical component that allows us to choose exactly what we do with each different and technically orthogonal input. We can choose any mapping we like between the inputs and the outputs. The circuits we have discussed allow any unitary or essentially lossless optical function, equivalent to any unitary matrix between the inputs and outputs. This is quite beyond what we could do before with optics, where we were restricted to specific mappings, such as imaging or Fourier transforms. Extensions of the ideas presented here can implement any linear transform, including non-unitary ones. These circuits are very well suited for implementation using silicon photonics, allowing much more complex circuits than we can otherwise imagine. Now we can make circuits with hundreds of interferometers and have them do what we want which historically would have been quite impossible. Who would have wanted to try to align a hundred interferometers? There are many possible applications and extensions of these ideas, and we've mentioned some of them already. Self-aligning beam couplers, tracking sources, automatic separation of modes you've seen. As I said, automatic analysis of the full amplitude and phase of an input field, correcting imperfections and removing aberrations, Phase conjugation is another thing these can do. They can undo scattering, including potential real-time self-configuration for undoing atmospheric turbulence, for example, or mode scattering in fibres. They can find the best channels for communications. These circuits can form self-calibrating, self-correcting and self-stabilising complex optical systems. They can calibrate and program other optical circuits and architectures,
they can perform arbitrary linear transforms, they can solve mathematical equations, they can make linear optical quantum circuits, optical neural networks, RF photonic circuits, and they allow new ways of sensing where we look for the features we want and can adapt and program those to the application. This is sometimes called super pixels, and one possible application of that is microscopy. These circuits we've been looking at are examples of a new class of photonic systems that we could call programmable photonics. This is a whole new field of optics, and it joins new insights into optical systems and the technology capable of substantial complexity with architectures and algorithms capable of exploiting and controlling that complexity.